Welcome back to Neural Notes. This is Chase Roberts, and I'm here with my partner, Sandy Badra. As a reminder, Neural Notes is a series where we're interviewing researchers who have written seminal academic papers. And the reason we're doing this is we've noticed that the distance between practice and what's coming out of research labs is converging almost to zero. And so a lot of what we're seeing within the research labs is what's coming next in, uh, in companies and practitioners who might use that research. So today we've got one of the smartest minds in machine learning, and we're going to talk two papers today, one called Hungry Hippos and another one called Monarch Mixer. And with that, we're going to do a quick introduction. And so I'd like to introduce Dan. Dan, can you introduce yourself and then tell us about your research focus area? Hi, uh, uh, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I've seen some of the videos already and they're really great. Really excited to talk about some of our work in, in this area today. A bit about me, so I'm a, a PhD at Stanford. I kind of work at the intersection of systems and machine learning. So I'm really interested kind of in developing more uh, kind of efficient architectures that can scale fundamentally better along some axis. Also really interested in trying to figure out how we can use classical like systems techniques to make these algorithms run faster in hardware. So both having that nice asymptotic scaling properties, those like big O properties that we talk a lot about, but also having things that run efficiently on hardware. Um, really excited about, about those two aspects. Yeah, I, I read a joke recently about how an A100 was actually a space heater, which occasionally produces LLM outputs. So you're, I guess you're helping solve some of that problem. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Awesome. I, yeah. <laughs> Let's go well, for that, That's a perfect transition. Talking about some of the problems with the heat coming off A100s and the compute restrictions that we have, what inspired the research that we're going to discuss today? Yeah, so today we're, a lot of the research that we're talking about today is inspired by a question that we started asking maybe two, two and a half years ago about what would you need to get a model that can really uh, eat up long context. So imagine a model that could interpret entire books or entire instruction manuals and then use that information to answer questions. I think since we started this, we've seen that there's been a lot of kind of uptick in this area. So long context is now one of those frontiers that lots of people talk about. OpenAI with their GPT-4 and then Claude, Anthropics Claude and, and things like that. So we're really glad to see that people picked up on this area since we've started. But for us, it was really the first principles what is the right architecture to, to be able to have a long context model? And I think we'll talk about the transformer, the kind of the basis of, of all the stuff that we've, that we've been seeing recently it has some fundamental properties that don't scale so well in long context. So that's what really prompted us to ask these questions around what is the right architecture? What is, are there things that aren't transformers that can still get things that are, have the quality that we've come to expect out of these language models? Let's, let's double click on that point. So you talk about looking at transformers and alternative architectures in service of better long context alternatives, but, but why do we need better long co context alter alternatives? What constraints are we running into? So really the fundamental bottleneck that we're running into here is the choice of this architecture that we chose to start scaling up years ago in 2017, 2018 called the transformer. So the transformer is really composed of two parts. One is uh, attention, which I'm sure your listeners are very familiar with from the famous attention is all you need paper. And then the MLP, which is your standard fully connected layer, ReLU, things like that. I want to dive a little bit into the what the attention part of that is doing. Attention is really a brute force approach to trying to understand words in a sentence. And the way that you can really think about that is given some sentence, given something that you've read or said, what attention will do is it will compare every single word in the, that sentence to every other word. And so if you think about it, you can really get all the interactions between the different words. But this is really how humans process language. If you're listening to this, you probably don't recall exactly what I said two sentences ago. When you're reading a book, you don't need to flip back to the beginning every time you read a new word. So this kind of brute force quadratic thing maybe isn't really the thing that we need to understand language. So what we are really interested in is, okay, so attention has worked when we've scaled it up, we've gotten these great models, but is there something else that kind of works maybe more like what you would expect where you understand what's going on and when you read new things, you just take it in instead of having to literally page back and forth to understand every single word. Right. 
you use the word that's really important and it's this concept of something being quadratic or, or attention being a quadratic mechanism. The fact that it is quadratic has some implication on the amount of compute required as you start to scale the context. So talk a little bit about that and the hardware constraints you run into with quadratic <laughs> methods. Yeah, exactly. The basic quadratic part comes from that comparing every word to every other word. If you are reading a sentence with, say, 10 words, so that, that's not too bad. There's roughly 100 comparisons that you have to make. If you read a, an essay that has 1,000 or 2,000 words, now when you're doing that kind of quadratic scaling, now every time you process a new word, you have to go and compare it to every other word. So that's what we mean by quadratics. And that's just 1,000 words. Now we're talking about... Models have 30,000, 100,000 words, and those we're talking into, I don't have off the top of my head, billions of comparisons to, to just process the text that you have. So th I think there's two more th concepts we should define, which will really help us understand this research. One is what a, a long convolution, and the other is element-wise gating. Why, why are these concepts relevant to this research? And, the, uh, and these are concepts from signal processing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So our, our basic question in kind of this line of research is you have this attention thing. It's comparing everything to everything else. The intuition is you need to be able to keep track of some ideas that you have when you're reading a book, you know what's going on. And we have some intuition that when you're reading a new word, it is useful to have the context around it. If you're just trying to parse five words, for instance, it's really hard to parse a single word in isolation without having kind of the context of the rest of the sentence. And so long convolutions and this element-wise gating, these are two pretty simple ideas, honestly, that, that we found have been pretty good in allowing us to approximate attention and get some of those nice properties back. So what we mean by long convolution, so that is, if you're familiar with a convolution from uh, images or something like that, what we're just saying with a long convolution is imagine a convolution filter, except it has access to the entire input. So there's a couple ways to think about this. You can think about it as aggregating some signal from your entire paragraph, from your entire essay at all times. You can think about it as taking a weighted average of the words that you've seen before. So that, that's something that the, the basic idea there is that lets you say, take ideas from earlier in your book or in your essay and carry them forward to now. So if there's some really important idea that I had from chapter one of my book, Harry Potter is the boy under the cupboard or something like that, then I can still carry that idea throughout the, the entire experience. The multiplicative gating, what that does is it lets you do a little bit of those local comparisons. What that lets you do is if you say the words Harry Potter together, I'm going to apparently I'm using that example a lot today. The word Potter by itself, there's lots of words that I could mean. You could be talking about the occupation. You could be talking about, I don't know, James Potter or Lily Potter. It's really when you see Harry and Potter together, you're like, oh, you're talking about that specific character. So that element-wise gating, what that allows you to do is you do get to see some comparisons between words. And it turns out these two ideas, some simple comparisons, and then some ability to keep around ideas for your entire whatever your context is, whether that's a paragraph or an essay or a book, turns out to be able to capture a lot of the aspects of language that we've been able to see with transformers with kind of that brute force approach. Oh, that's very cool. In, in some ways, you're effectively saying, hey, instead of a full matrix, we are going to have a bunch of these long convolutions and then we're going to gate them at the end. It's almost like a classic sort of filter design, right? Exactly. Uh, that, and so talk to us a little bit about this, right? I think your first paper, I think in H3, you defined this class of data controlled operators, which is effectively like a large filter, which is also a function of the data itself, right? And, mm -hmm. and you create this operator through a combination of multiplicative gating and long convolutions. Talk a little bit about what led you to start thinking about this combo and what does it imply? For, for the class of subquadratic operations you guys are contemplating. Right, yeah. So I think for this, it's really interesting to talk about the path that we took to, to get to where we are now and where we've distilled it down into these two basic ideas. So starting with H3, that first paper, Hungry Hungry Hippos, we were actually looking at almost a different class of 
of operating is called state-space models. So a state-space model you can think of is a mixture between a convolution and kind of a recurrent neural net. Um, yeah. One way to think, so it's a classic idea from signal processing. If you took electrical engineering classes in undergrad, you probably had a, a couple lectures about this, but the basic idea is that there's this class of mathematical object that you can think about as a convolution. It's this long convolution idea but that you can also interpret it as a recurrent system where there's some, some state that you're carrying around and just updating recurrently. And that's actually where we started understanding this relationship between a convolution and this idea that you can actually use it to carry information across, across your whole sequence. So in H3, that's what we were looking at. We were looking at state-space models, which is just a, a particular way of you can think of it as parameterizing a convolution in a learnable okay. way. So you yeah. guys do a bunch yeah. of like fancy linear algebra and basically reduce a very generalized and computa potentially computationally complex state space matrices into very simple, easily computable like convolutions and gates. That's the work in Henry Hippo. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So in H3, awesome. we were starting with the state space models. And some follow-ups, there's one called simple long convolutions or something. Follow-ups like Hyena, we realized you don't actually need all this fancy architecture. One of the follow-ups or convolution was literally the parameterization was NN dot parameter. It's just an array of weights. And Hyena, there's a little MLP that generates them. But yeah, so H3 was where we started with this idea of state-space models, where we first realized that gating is really important to get the quality, the language quality right. back. Then in follow-ups, we've realize, hey, you can just do it with a simple convolution. If, if conv1d were computationally efficient, then you could even replace it with conv1d and it would do almost the same thing. Awesome. So you used associative recall as the mm -hmm. task to benchmark the performance of these new architectures to transformers. Why did you choose this task and, and what were the results of these comparisons? Yeah, so that's a really great point. So. When we started this, the only way that we knew or, or people knew how to do language model design was to go train a giant model for hundreds of millions of tokens. The dev cycle would be come up with something, spin off a job, wait a few days, and then see if it scales. And we very quickly realized that this was a very expensive way to test out new ideas and not the most effective. So with associate recall, what we really wanted to do was we wanted to find, is there some little toy task that kind of captures the basic ideas of language, but that will give us signal so that if we have an architecture that kind of works on these toy tasks, are they still going to work on the downstream? So we started with associate recall since then we've come up with a bunch of other ones, but associate recall is really the most simple first step in this. So the way you can think about it is you have some sentence, there's some keys and values. You can have your keys be letters like A, B, C, and D. Your values are things like one, two, three, and four. In each sentence, there's some mapping between them and you just see key value pairs. And then at the end, you see some key that doesn't have the value and you just need to predict what that value is. This is an extremely simple task. You could solve it with a few lines of Python, but really the question is somehow, it captures some of these basic concepts of language, like this ability to recall, to look back at the beginning of the sentence and see things that you've seen before, to bring them upwards, to do some local comparisons to figure out, okay, which key am I supposed to bring back? Things like that. Somehow this little toy task seems to capture a lot of those key ideas about, about basic language, which is really amazing. You mentioned this associative recall task, and I suspect that the value of using this task is you're not burning up all your compute budget at Stanford, but I suspect that there is interest in what happens if we run this on much more complex tasks that are actually reflective of how we would experience with these in a day-to-day -day context. Are there efforts underway to test them on more complex tasks, perhaps right, outside yeah. of Stanford? Yeah, yeah. I can basically describe our basic process there. The process is the, these associative recall tasks can run in minutes on your laptop. So we use that to quickly iterate over the course of however long we're designing the things. That's where we figured out that this gating was important, that these convolutions were a good idea. And then once you have a good candidate architecture, of course, then you have to go and actually scale it up, train the large model and see if it actually translates to language. Because when we started 
We didn't know if that was necessarily going to be the case. And in fact, early on, we had some other tasks that were simpler versions of associate recall that when we scaled those up, they didn't quite work. It's a mixture of iterating on the synthetics, iterating on your architecture, and then at the end, train an actual language model and see, does it match the performance of transformers? Current to your research, you talked about like how large context windows and sequences is one of the frontiers of research in large language models. Concurrent to your work has been work in the community on R, W, K, V, retina, mm -hmm. position encoding, mm -hmm. etc. Whereas you guys have taken this sort of very mathematical foundation slash like single processing approach towards it. How does this parametrized way of looking at attention, how does that help the train of research that you guys are following perhaps? It's really great that you bring up some of those other architectures because, like I said, there's a lot of really great work here right now and we're really excited. I'd say there's a few categories of ways that people have approached this. So one is the take your transformer and do the smallest delta from it to try to get something to work. So the positional uh, encoding interpolation, that's a really excellent work where you look at what is really the bottleneck of just making it able to, let's say, run a transformer without it airing out or returning some, I don't have the weights for it. And really that's just taking the positional encodings and turns out if fiddle with them correctly, you can get a model that kind of extrapolates to longer sequences. RWKV is one that I love. So that's some folks who have been looking at it specifically just from the kind of the recurrent view. So there are actually some fundamental similarities to the SSMs to H3 in that I think there's a way to cast the RWKV as an SSM, obviously a lot more work to do there. So they were taking this old idea of RNNs, how can we get to it? How can we just make it work? And we, we really love that. Some of these newer ideas, RetNet, I think there was one from Facebook or Meta called Mega. These are combining attention and SSMs or attention and these, these blocked things in different ways. And yeah, really love, love all the work there. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. At, at the high level, everybody seems to be figuring out that to understand associations between the first chapter and the 12th chapter of the Harry Potter book, you don't need to perhaps keep track of every word, but you can keep track of some of the waves of information that transfer mm -hmm. from chapter to chapter. And I guess that will help with the rest of our chapter about FFTs, et cetera, as well. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. How well do these models perform once you've used H3 or quote unquote real world models, right? Now that you've trained them with, with the associative learning. Yeah. So that's one of the kind of exciting things about the results of this line of research is that we've started to see that they can match transformers and language modeling up to scales of a few billion parameters where we're still scaling it up, obviously, but just in terms of that basic language modeling task, they seem to be performing pretty well. So in H3, we were uh, pretty close to matching in follow-ups with like Hyena and things like this. We were, we were outperforming transformers and in further follow-ups like uh, Monarch Mixer, which we'll talk about more in a bit, we were again outperforming transformers in a match, flop to flop match or parameter to parameter match settings. That's really exciting because A, it tells you that at least for this task called language, like you don't need the transformer. There are other things that work um, and for kind of other tasks, like tasks where you actually want to scale up to much longer, you can do that without paying the quadratic cost. Um, so there's some modalities where that's really interesting. One of my lab mates, Eric, he has this great work called Hyena DNA, which kind of builds on these ideas and applies it to DNA models. And that's a really exciting one where the basic idea was you take some language modeling approach to modeling DNA sequences, and then you just increase the sequence length to a million and the performance just keeps getting better the longer you go. So that seems to be a modality where longer sequences really translated to, to higher quality and better models. And we're really excited to see more and more of these modalities pop up. And does this also translate into sort of computational advantages during inference time? Yeah, so the inference is really interesting. During training, I think we'll talk about it in a bit, we can use the FFT to do everything. It scales in and log in. But one of the nice things coming, going back to the SSM work is that there's this whole mathematical regime where you can have a convolution and you can also turn it into a, re a recurrence. So the nice thing about a recurrence is that Topless, every time you generate matrices, you guys talk about topless matrices. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
the nice thing about a recurrence is that generating a new token is O of one or O of your model dimension, basically. And so what that means is that normally with transformers, when you generate a new token, you have to go compare that new word that you just generated with every other word that you put before, before you can decide what to say next. Uh, the, you can actually play with this a little bit. If you go into your chat GPT and paste in a really long essay, it will take forever to generate new tokens. It will be a lot slower than generating, answering a short prompt. And with these you know, convolutions, basically, if you train them as an SSM, like an H3, you automatically get this recurrence for free. If you train it as a convolution, you can actually then go and turn it back into an SSM, and then you get the recurrence properties back. So you get a lot faster, fundamentally faster inference, which is very exciting. Very cool. You started talking about, about training some of these models and the advantages that it turns out that there's been a lot of work and a lot of hardware to make convolutions easy in the in the Fourier domain by using FFTs and inverse FFTs. Talk a little bit about what does it do in terms of scaling from, so it brings it down from N squared to N log N, right? Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the applicability given current hardware of FFT and related techniques, which probably gets us to the Monarch uh, Mixer work as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that relationship is, so basically there's a fundamental primitive that kind of underlies all this work. So we're training all these long convolutions and things. And so far I've been saying that it's been faster, it's been subquadratic. But if you take something like PyTorch and then .conv 1D and you run it with a super long window, you're going to find a very slow model because the traditional way you think about a convolution is... It's like the way that you just write it down naively, it's also actually a quadratic operator. So this is where we go back to some of our signal processing roots. And there's turns out there's another way to compute this convolution. And we'll, we'll have a blog post up uh, on this either soon or maybe by the time this goes out, out already talking about some of these connections. But another way that you compute the a convolution is that you can take the FFT of the input and the FFT of your convolution filter and then just multiply them together. So that pointwise multiplication comes back again. Uh, and then that's another way that gets you mathematically the same answer as if you had done that whole sliding window thing. So that, that fast Fourier transform, that FFT really underlies all of these models. And the FFT is computable in n log n. So that's what gets us that kind of that subquadratic scaling. An interesting bit there is FFTs don't actually have great support on modern hardware. Why is that? And then how did you guys make modifications so that you could actually get... And when you say modern hardware, you mean GPUs, correct? We just we started talking yes, about... Yes, on about GPUs. A1, we started talking about A100s, basically. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so there's a couple interesting things going on there. And there's lots of great people in NVIDIA who are actively working on this, but we needed to do a little bit of CUDA hacking to make things run as fast as we needed. So one bit is that... These A100s, H100s, everything for the past, I don't know how, how long here, they've all been half focused, decade. yeah, half a decade, have been focused on speeding up matrix, matrix. multiplication. Exactly, exactly. So in, on GPUs, they call these tensor cores. Obviously, Google has the TPUs, which are the you know, tensor processing units. And these things are all really specialized to do a matrix multiplication. And the FFT, the way that you traditionally write the algorithm down is you break up your FFT into smaller and smaller FFTs until at the end you're doing things that are just flow operations or half operations. And those kind of can't really use the tensor cores. So they can't use the full compute capabilities of the GPUs. So what we had to develop is we, we were developing algorithms that you can think about it as stopping the FFT um, decomposition partway through at a point where the flop cost is technically higher, you're technically paying more flops, but you can run those flops on the tensor cores. So the upshot is that you break down these FFTs into a series of kind of matrix multiplication operations, and technically you're paying more flops than the, than the traditional FFT algorithm, but those flops are going 10, 15 times faster because they're running on the tensor cores instead of running on the rest of the GPU. For some context on A100, the tensor cores, you can get up to, let's say it's 300 teraflops and other operations you are limited to kind of 20 teraflops. So it's really a 15 times speed up if you can use those tensor cores to do your computation. So far we've been talking about attention, right? 
The other piece that you talked about of the transformer architecture, which is also quadratic, is multi-layer perceptron, the MLP. Talk a little bit about how does one go about making that sub-quadratic? Yeah, so here, here the real insight was that we could take the FFT computation pattern and generalize it. And so that's some work that's come in the lab. They're called monarch matrices. The basic idea there is, so the FFT algorithm takes an FFT, breaks it down into smaller FFTs. Then for us, at some point, you stop at some matrix that can fit onto the tensor cores. The basic idea behind a monarch matrix is, okay, you have this computation that's basically at the end breaks down into reorder your input a little bit, do a tensor core matrix multiply operation, reorder a little bit, do that again. So if you're computing the FFT, that tensor core operation is use the FFT values, the FFT constants. The idea behind a monarch matrix is, okay, what if we just learn those parameters? In essence, you get something that is the same computational cost of kind of this optimized for GPU FFT operation, but you're getting more parameters. So instead of using the fixed FFT values, you're now learning these values. And that, that's a basic idea behind the monarch matrix. What was interesting about that is turns out you can do that exact same thing and replace the MLP. So you can actually replace the dense layers in your multi-layer perceptron also with these, these block diagonal matrices. And this is now getting to Monarch Mixer. We realize, okay, we've been using these FFTs to replace attention, to mix tokens, compare tokens across the sequence. What if we did a similar thing, a similar computational pattern to also replace the MLP and actually do mixing along, along the hidden dimension? And when we did that, so you get something that is now subquadratic in the sequence length, subquadratic in the hidden dimension. And in Monarch Mixer, we were finding that we can actually match in quality, which was pretty exciting. That's amazing. Yeah. So that takes us to performance. So how are these new architectures performing relative to other methods? Yeah, so with Monarch Mixer, the basic pitch is replace attention with something subquadratic, replace MLP with something subquadratic, and then see how well it does. So our question was, okay, can we take some key use cases of transformers over the past five, six years, and then replace them with Monarch Mixer? And does the quality still perform as well? When we were doing the evaluation, we were thinking, okay, let's trace the history of transformers back from wherever they were five, six years ago and trace them forward. So what we did is we went back to BERT style models and replaced attention and replaced the transformers there. We looked at vision transformers, kind of image classification. And then we also looked at GPT style. So I'll briefly talk about kind of those, those architectures and those results. So with Monarch Mixer, we were able to, in the BERT style modeling, we were able to replace both BERT base and BERT large with Monarch Mixer kind of primitives. When we did that, we were able to match the performance of BERT base and BERT large with kind of 25% fewer parameters. That's what subquadratic in the model dimension, subquadratic in the model width, that's what that buys you. The same performance with fewer parameters. And then, of course, it was also subquadratic in the sequence length. So that means that a longer sequence is like at 8K input, BERT is usually, the input is usually like 512. We can scale our models up to 8K or beyond. And at those levels, you're talking about 10 times faster or even 10, 10 plus times faster than the transformers. So that was really exciting. 2018 transformers checked off the box. Next, we went to the vision transformers, the next revolution and people realizing that transformers can do everything. And again, the story was very similar where we were able to match image net performance on vision transformers with fewer parameters and with something that scaled better. And then we, of course, jumped to the GPT style models, GPT-2, 2020s or late or early 2020s, 2022, 2021. And there again, we were the able to, stuff. exactly, we were able to replace attention and MLP. For the GPT style, we found something even weirder, which is we just got rid of the MLP completely. So our GPT model on the Monarch Mixer paper is just a bunch of mixing over the sequence sort of attention replacement just stacked all over. We literally replaced the MLP layer with NN.identity. So it, it didn't do anything. And surprisingly, when we scaled that up, it also worked. So that was just really a really exciting result for us because people think that transformers are the end all be all. You really need the specialized architecture to do everything. 
Turns out you can just rip parts out and it works, which is amazing. So, so what is the largest sequence length you guys tested for with using, say, something like Monarch Mixers? And in terms of flops, like how much more efficient was it relative to the regular instantiation of a GPT or a transformer style model? Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a couple pieces here. It really depends on the application and the end use case. So in some of the kind of these synthetic associated recall tasks, we, we were scaling up to hundreds of thousands early this year. There are some other kind of image classification tasks where long context really translates a higher resolution. And so there, there are some tasks from like the long range arena benchmark. We were scaling up to 64,000, things like that. And finding that we were able to not only outperform the transformers, the, the transformer wouldn't even fit on the GPU, but we were able to still get really good performance. And since then, there's been follow-ups like Hyena DNA, where they've gone to a million context length and where there, there isn't really even a, a, a sane comparison you can make to transformers. You can say it's hundreds or whatever times faster, but at those sequence lengths, nobody can even run a standard transformer. But yeah, that's the regimes that we're looking at. Opens up new possibilities, new modalities, new tasks that just weren't possible before. Well, so I think that points to a discussion around some of the use cases. And I think it's important to also note that you're not necessarily saying that, hey, we should replace attention you know, you, across the board. You're saying, hey, for long context, attention's brute force approach is not necessarily scalable. And so we, we have to consider other things given our current hardware constraints. You look at the use cases that have really long context, like you mentioned the hyena DNA work, which is essentially DNA is just a lot of text. And we're applying these models to that text. You know, there are other applications that are also just a lot of text, like code or perhaps even like video. Talk to me about some of the use cases where you're like, hey, these are the places where we, we anticipate this model architecture to be more useful or more applicable. Yeah, yeah. So you touched on one of them, which is code, I think. So when we release H3, when we release Hyena, we got a lot of interest from who, people who are building like co-pilots or, or things like that, where you really want your agent, your co-pilot to be, really be able to read your entire repository, figure out what functions you're trying to call, read multiple files at once. Code is a really exciting one. We've been talking to people who want to use it to help doctors process their medical notes. So this is something I learned when we started releasing these models that when doctors write medical notes, it's a, let's call it a bit of a naive system where a doctor will type in a note and type in their update. And then the next time they'll copy and paste their entire note and copy it up into their next note and they'll append it to, to what they had before. So you get these medical note documents that are tens of thousands of words long. And then when a new doctor comes in or when you're the same doctor, but you haven't seen the patient for six months, you go look at this giant file and you have to figure out uh, what was relevant, what was the relevant thing, like what changed last time to actually work. There's legal document processing where lawyers famously love to write lots of words. So if you're going to process no, a whole brief, no way. <laughs> exactly. Or if you want to process a whole legal code or something like that, the U.S. legal code, there's just a ton of text there and being able to really handle that long context is going to be really important for kind of all those use cases. Yeah. And those are just a few off the top of my head where I've been learning about all these end applications that, that have been really exciting as well. Are there results out for any of those end applications or is it still like people working on them? Let's see. So the DNA stuff, the hyena DNA, that's up on archive. I think the code stuff is happening mostly in industry, actually. So yeah. people were trying to get people to put up some blog posts. So if, if you're listening to this and you're one of those people, maybe this is a little a little prod to, <laughs> to get the, some of those blogs up. We'll, I think we'll our friends at Microsoft, Dan, we'll call our friends at Microsoft. Exactly. Exactly. Dan, one, one crucial bit of information here is that a lot of this code is available on GitHub, correct? For exactly. somebody who is not an expert in Monarch matrices or in linear algebra to actually get going very quickly. When we tweet about this, I'm sure we'll put out the GitHub repo as well so that people can go and download it. And, and so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that brings us toward the end. Perhaps one, one final question. Uh, where, where is the research headed? Where are you excited to look next? 
Yeah. So where we're really excited is continuing these ideas of, let's call it software hardware co-design, where we're designing new models that kind of address fundamental bottlenecks, but also making sure that they run efficiently. The FFT work that we had to do, the Monarch work that we had to do, those really come down to there's this architecture that was more efficient, but we needed to put in the work to actually make it run faster. Maybe there are new, as people develop new chips, there's going to be the H100 has all these fancy new features. Maybe there are different things that, that we can play with there. As GPUs get more and more expensive, more and more in demand, we're really excited about if we fundamentally change the flop profiles of some of these models, maybe it's easier to run them on CPU and, and run inference on CPU and things like that maybe really opens up the possibilities for where you can run these models and what you can do. So along all those directions, looking at the hardware landscape, looking at the compute resources that are available, looking at the applications that people want to run and figuring out how can we make the architectures work across all these use cases for all these people. Amazing. Dan, where can people find you online and more about this research? Let's see. I'm on Twitter. I think I'm on threads. I may be on Mastodon, but I don't remember anymore. And I also have a personal website, danfu.org. See my Twitter. I think it's at real Dan Fu or something like that. Do it. And we'll link to it. <laughs> yeah, I tweet about my work when it goes out and we release papers, code, everything, usually all at the same time. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. It was really great to be on. This was a fun recording. Thanks for doing this. Take care.